Love y'all. Love y'all. I am so super excited to be here with all of you this morning and get to share a message that I believe has been laid on my heart. And like I said, this is like the first sermon ever. So this is going to be chaotic. Not, not really, but that's what we're going to be talking about. And I've been super blessed with so many awesome people just this morning alone giving me, giving me advice and giving me, you know, tips as how I should, you know, handle myself in the pulpit. You know, one person said you should have a full mental breakdown about three quarters of the way through. I was told that I should take my jacket off and, and throw it into the crowd. So I'm right-handed, so those over here, you might want to watch out. Grandma, keep your head down. Um, so, you know, there's that. I was also told I should, like, Hulk Hogan my shirt and, like, completely rip it off. So um, luckily I have an undershirt, so, you know, not going to expose myself too much. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, awesome, awesome. But like I said, I am super excited to be here this morning. But before I get too deep into the message, I just wanted to take a second to personally recognize you as a congregation. I came here at the beginning of the summer, honestly, not knowing what to expect, a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious. But getting to come here and, and pour into the students, to love on the students, to get to know them, to get to know their names, their stories, their struggles, how, what their walks with God look like, it's been such a blessing. And also, getting to each, each and every one of you, getting to sit down with all of you and be able to share meals, hear your stories, get the, the privilege to share mine. It's been nothing short of a blessing. Especially, I want to thank the Beasleys for shacking me up, you know, when I'm here. I really, really appreciate y'all and everything that you've done for me. But I could go on and on all day long, all morning, and, and keep going and never fully express the gratitude that I have for each and every one of you who have blessed me so abundantly. So the simplest way I know to put it is thank you for, for blessing my life and taking me into this church family in the beautiful way that you have. So thank you for that. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge blessing to be able to come up here and speak this morning. When Pastor Rick first approached me and told me he wanted me to preach, I, just, I didn't think much of it. Okay, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm going to preach to the students every week. But he said, no, I want you to preach to the whole congregation. And that's when the thrill really started to set in. But I also had a sense of anxiety because when Pastor Rick came to me and said this, he said, the entire Bible is your playground. As long as you don't preach outright heresy or anything derogatory, you can preach from whatever you want. And, you know, that it sounds like an awesome opportunity, and it is. But, guys, this is a big book, and it's, there's a lot in here. There's a lot of things about God, about man, about how we should carry ourselves. And I was honestly overwhelmed by, by this opportunity. You know, this, there's so much packed in here. I get one Sunday, what should I preach on? What's relevant? What can the people apply to their lives today? And over this month and a half, as I was, as I was navigating, what am I going to preach on? What am I going to speak on? I couldn't help but, but notice the things going on in our world around us today. I couldn't help but notice the events of, of the last few weeks, of the last few months. And that gradually got longer, that time span that I was thinking on, the, the months, the years of how we've gotten to the point we're at today. I mean, we look at just the past few days, the past few weeks. I'm going to sway a lot, by the way. So I'm just, I like to, I like to move. And I'm very flamboyant with my hands. But anyway, I was, I was really just reflecting on everything that's transpired over the last few, you know, years, weeks, days. You know, just in the past few weeks alone, we've had a presidential candidate almost get assassinated. Another one shocked the world and dropped out of the race. No one would have expected that. Just four years ago, not that long ago, we had a global pandemic, something that scared our scientists because they didn't fully understand it. It seems like every other day we wake up and we, we look to the Middle East and we see conflict arising. It seems like every other day we wake up and turn on our news channels and two countries are, are squabbling and we start to wonder and we start to ponder, is this the beginning of, of World War III? Should we, like, brace for war, start building shelters? And... Throughout this entire line of thought, I, I couldn't help but think the world has gotten to a point where it's just so chaotic, so hectic. It, we really don't know what to expect day by day. And as I was navigating that, as I was thinking about that, one question that was really laid on my heart is how should we Christians, how should we believers handle ourselves, conduct ourselves in times of adversity, in times of chaos, and when the path doesn't seem that, that clear? How should we operate in that time period? And I began to search. I began to think. I began to pray. I asked mentors for advice and things of that. And ultimately, my search led me to one of the Old Testament prophets, 
as I read his story, I think his story really aligns with our world today. And that's something we're going we're gonna to explore. We're going to look at his life, see what he experienced, see how he handled himself, see what God had to say about it. So we're going to turn to an Old Testament book you've probably never heard of called Habakkuk. It's towards the end of your Old Testament. I'd recommend you either go straight to your table of contents or go to your Old Test or go to your Old Testament New Testament divider and just start flipping back. Habakkuk chapter 3. While y'all are on your way there, I want to take some time to kind of lay the groundwork, lay the foundation, explain where we're at in the world at this time. So if we look at the prophet himself, I'm going to be honest with you guys, we don't know a lot about this guy. We really don't. We have his three-chapter book at the end of the Old Testament. We believe, based off what we see in the text, that he was an active member of temple worship, specifically in the music department. Something unique to this prophet is rather than being a messenger, like most prophets, his book is almost exclusively a dialogue between him and God. When we look at other prophets like Jeremiah, we see him delivering a message. I loved the way Mr. Basco put it in his theology class last week. Prophets were for when kings were not exercising their authority properly or when the priests had become corrupt. But generally, the role of a prophet was to get a message from God. They might talk to God about it a little bit, but ultimately deliver this message to the people. We don't really see that in Habakkuk. It's really just a dialogue between God and Habakkuk back and forth. Habakkuk asks a question. God answers, and they go back and forth and go from there. So we're in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Let's dive in. After I read, we're going to take a quick second to go to the Lord in prayer. Habakkuk chapter 3, 17 says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ, God. As we uh, break down the experience of this prophet here, Lord, I pray that you um, open our hearts to hear your word, God, and understand it, Lord. God, speak louder than me. I pray that you move mightily in this place. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, just looking over the, these two verses, I don't know what you were thinking as I read or as you read them uh, silently, but I was honestly in awe. I was shocked by what the prophet was saying here. What, essentially what he's saying is there's no food anywhere. There's no food in my refrigerator. There's no food at the grocery store, at the grocery store in the town over or the town over from that. I don't know when my next meal is coming. I don't even know if I'm going to get the chance to eat again. Yet still, I'm going to choose to rejoice in the Lord. And you are probably thinking the same thing that I'm thinking right now. What happened to this guy? What happened to him? What did God do in his life? What did he experience? What experience did he experience to make him say something so bold and so profound? I don't know if I'm going to eat again, but I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Friends, I don't know about you, but once I get hungry, we have about 30 minutes until I'm a different person. And if I were to describe that person, it's not joyful, quite frankly. It's not joyful. So my, the, the question that kept ringing was, why is he saying something so bold and so profound? Does he just have that much faith? Well, luckily, we started at the end of the book, so we have some context before this. So how did we get to this point? Let's flip to chapter 1, verse 1, the very beginning. It's probably only one or two pages back, and see where this, where this guy came from. <clears throat> and we're going to start with chapter 1, verse 1, and read through verse 4. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, Lord, must I call for your help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction, violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous, so the justice is perverted. Now, friends, I hope the first thing that we can pick up on here is the stark contrast 
between verses 1, what we just read, and verses three, uh, chapter 3, verses 17 through 18 that we just finished reading. As we can see in these opening verses, the prophet is at a point of, of great anguish, great heartache. He's questioning, why are these things happening? There's so much going on around me. Yet two chapters down the line, he's rejoicing. He doesn't know where his next meal is coming, yet he's going to rejoice. And I think that just, that just deepens our question and our curiosity about this guy. What happened in these two chapters where he could say something so profound, how he could have such a 180-degree a turn about his situation? Well, let's, let's uh, take a look at that. Geographically, Habakkuk is in Judah. So as he is listing off these complaints, violence, injustice, wrongdoing, death and destruction, violence, again, and strife, he's speaking about the nation of Judah. Judah's fallen into a a deep state of of wickedness. And quite frankly, friends, as I look at our world today, it's, it's it's hard to see a difference. I see a world full of hate and corruption and evil where we look to our leaders and rather than seeing solutions for our problems, we see slander for their rivals. Right has become wrong, wrong has become right. How did we get to this point? Well, let's let's take a a deeper look at this. You know, we see Habakkuk, but I imagine for, for all of the followers of the Lord at this time, all of them were feeling this way and questioning, God, why are these things happening? And I wonder for us, have we ever been in a situation like that? where something tragic has happened. Maybe we've, we've been in an accident. Maybe we've lost a loved one, a, a child or a grandchild. Maybe something catastrophic has happened in our lives. And we can't help but look to the Lord and say, God, why has this happened? What's going on? We look at the people around us who are so wicked or so, do so much wrong. We wonder, God, are you even still there? That's the same question that, that the prophet here is, is asking. And You know, when things happen, I would encourage each and every one of you to turn to the Lord, just as the prophet did here. Stuff's going bad. Stuff's going wrong. So rather than sitting around moping about it, Habakkuk, he turns to the Lord and begins to question, God, why are these things happening? And that's our first point for today. When when in the chaos, turn to the Lord with your questions. He is faithful to answer. You know, I've noticed this stigma in Christian circles lately that we can't go to God with our questions. Well, if I question God, if I doubt God, if I have a question about a circumstance, well, I doubt God. I don't have enough faith. Maybe I'm not even a Christian. Guys, this, this stigma is so, much, so far from the truth. I would remind you, I would encourage you all to think of various people throughout the Bible. Think the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 12. He went to God with a very similar question. God, why are things the way they are? Why are the wicked prospering? Like, what's going on? I would encourage you to think about Moses during the Exodus in chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, also during the Exodus. He went to God for reassurance. He questioned, he asked, God, help me out. Help me to see the the end of this trek through the wilderness. But I also think about Job. Well, what about, who was Job? He was the guy who lost his wife his kids, his family, his lands, all of his money. And his entire book pretty much consists of him saying, God, why are these things happening? Why is is tragedy taking place? And as I said, friends, the more I think about and contemplate the things that that are going on in our lives today, in the world today, the more parallels I see between our world and the prophet Habakkuk's. So in times of chaos, when you can't see the clear path, when you don't understand why things are the way they are, again, I would implore you, take your questions to the Lord. He is faithful to respond. So many of you are also probably thinking, what about the prophet? You've talked about Jeremiah. You've talked about about Job. Well, how did God respond to the prophet? Well, let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at, at chapter 1 verse 5. Look at the nations, watch, and be utterly amazed. For I am doing something in your days that you would not believe, even if I told you. The first thing that pops out is this idea of something amazing. 
what was that amazing thing? Well, if we look throughout history and we focus in on the things that were transpiring at the time, it could have been a number of things. We're not quite sure. Egypt, one of the most dominant global world powers in all of history, fell in almost a night. Well, also, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, known as Nineveh, was sacked in a way that no one would have believed. And now the Babylonians, the Babylonian Empire, was raising, rising to power. Any of those events could have been part of what God was talking about. may not have been the focus, but it could have been encapsulated in his point. Ultimately, we get our answer later on in the Old Testament. In Acts 13.41, Paul uses these words given by the prophet to kind of underscore the, the amazing transformative nature of the gospel. So ultimately, this amazing thing that the Lord is, is doing culminates in Jesus. But I want to look at the, the wordage that God uses here. And really take a second to focus in on that. As Habakkuk goes to God with questions, with seeking understanding, God says, for I am going to do something in your days. Some, Some texts say I am doing something in your days. Friends, as Habakkuk was worrying, as God, as Habakkuk was questioning, God, are you even there? God replies and says, this whole time you've been worrying, I've been working. Friends, you could honestly probably speak to this better than I could out of the simple fact that most of you are older than I am. And I promise I'm not calling you old. You've just lived more life than I have. But there have been several times throughout my life, throughout my experience, where I've looked at a situation. I don't know how that's going to work out. I've looked at a relationship. How can I save that? How can I get that job? How can I get into that school? And quite frankly, friends, as hard as I think about it, I'm not the not the brightest person in the world. In a, in a drawer full of dives, I'd be a spoon. But um, the more I think about it, as logically as I can think about it, I can't figure how this situation, whatever it may be, is going to work together. Have you all ever been in a time like that where you just look at a situation and say, I can't see how this ends. I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel because that's the situation Habakkuk's in now. Yet as he questions God, God says, take a deep breath. I'm working. I'm pulling things together. Now, friends, I'm not saying that everything is going to work out for their best. Unfortunately, it's not. But all things will work together. We see that multiple times throughout Scripture. We're going to find out how that works for the prophet here. What about other examples in Scripture? Well, think Ruth. Who was Ruth? Ruth was a common-born, seemingly insignificant Moabite woman, Moabite widow, who no one would have batted an eye at at the time. Well, it just so happens that that, uh, Ruth ended up in the same field as a man named Boaz. It just so happened that they met up. It just so happened that they started talking. It just so happened that they got along. It just so happened that Boaz was capable and willing of taking care, uh, taking Ruth as, as a wife and providing for her. It just so happened that they were able to have kids. It just so happened that all the generations thereafter fell in line leading to David. It just so happens all of the generations that fell in line after David ultimately culminated in Jesus. All that just so happened. No, friends, when something just so happens so many times, we have to look at it and say that didn't just so happen. Rather, that ordainly happened. So all that to say, this seemingly insignificant woman that no one would have batted an eye at, no one would have, most people wouldn't have even known her name. God used behind the scenes hundreds of years before the time of Jesus to ultimately bring forth Jesus. And we see that alluded to here in Habakkuk chapter 1. See, friends, Habakkuk is believed, based off the events that have taken place, as I mentioned earlier, believed to have been taken place between the year of 610 and 590 B.C. So from these words here, God was already pulling together, working the strings to ultimately culminate in his son Jesus. 600 years before his birth. God was was pulling things together. As I hear that, as I think about that, 600-year time span, go back to Genesis. We see Jesus alluded to in Genesis. 
If God can work over 600 years and further to culminate his plan, to bring together his plan, how much can God work in the now for each of us? So that leads us to to point number two. In times of chaos, God's faithfulness reminds us that he is sovereign. God is in complete control of every aspect of the world at all times. So in times of chaos, know the Lord is sovereignly in control. Now, we're about to make a big jump. I'm going to drop like a 55-gallon drum of information on you. But we're going to make a big jump from chapter 1, verse 5, to chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. So please stick with me. I'm going to fill you all in on everything we're about to, about to miss. God continues his reply by saying, Habakkuk, I'm raising up those cruel, wicked, vicious Babylonians you've been hearing about as my tool of judgment for Judah. Habakkuk replies, well, God, why would, you, why would you use a nation or a country that's so wicked and so evil to carry out your plan? To which God replies with three things. He says, I'll deal with the Babylonians in time. For now, they're my tool. I'm going to judge the people of Judah, but I'm going to sustain my people. The righteous, the faithful, I'm going to sustain them. I'm going to watch out for them. And we see that in chapter 2, verse 4, which says, See the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. We see this again quoted by by the Apostle Paul in, in Galatians and again in Romans as he reiterates that through the faith that God, that Habakkuk had in God, he'll live. And in the same way, our faith today that we have in Jesus, we will live by that faith. And that's the reality Habakkuk comes to. After hearing these words, after hearing these, this, after realizing this reality that, that God has shown him, he realizes, I don't know what's coming. I don't know what hardship's on the way. God, you've said it's on the way. I'm going to trust it's on the way. But God, you said that, I, that the righteous will live by faithfulness. Well, the question then becomes, why does he say this? Why does Habakkuk trust just based off these few words in chapter 2, verse 4? Well, friends, chapter 3 opens up with Habakkuk reflecting and recounting how God has been faithful, how God has delivered his people. He cites specific events in Israel's history, like the Exodus the parting of the Red Sea, the leading through the wilderness. And Habakkuk comes to the realization that all throughout history, all throughout time, even when humans have been unfaithful, the Lord has been faithful. And that God that was faithful in the past, he's faithful today, and he's going to be faithful tomorrow and the day after that and for the rest of history. Amen. And that's the realization, the reality, the the turning point, the crux, if you will, that really makes that change in Habakkuk's mind, where he's able to go from that state of, of anguish, of lament, of hardship, to that of joy, saying, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's coming. It's going to be bad. You've, God, you've said it's going to be bad. But I have that faithful God who has always looked out for his people who has always sustained his people through thick and thin. Does that mean everything is going to be fun and prosperity all the time? Does that mean every prayer is going to be answered with a yes? No, that's not what it means, unfortunately. If anything, we're promised the opposite, that the Christian walk is one of, of hardship and suffering. But still, we have that, those words from our faithful God, who has promised that his people will live by faith. And that same God that has extended those words to the prophet Habakkuk extends those same words to us today. So, as we reflect on the verses we open with, chapter 3, 17 and 18, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. 
So friends, after we've had a time to to look at Habakkuk's life, look at the things that he's gone through, look at the things he's experienced, we realize that he's not simply just talking about food in chapter 17. No, his situation is far more dire. A notorious, wicked, evil people are well on their way to smash the nation where Habakkuk lives at. He is looking death and destruction in the face. Yet because he has that faithful God, who has been faithful to his people all throughout history, he can look at that death and destruction and hardship and say, yes, I don't know what's coming. I don't know the extent of this this evil wickedness that's coming. But I do have a faithful God. And I can trust in him. I can rejoice in that fact that I have the faithful God who has promised to sustain me through the good times, through the bad, through the mountains, through the valleys, and every other time in between. So that question that we asked at the beginning, how did we get there? How did we get to the point where, where we can look at death and destruction in the face and, and be joyful? It's because we have a faithful God. It's because we have a faithful God. So the question then becomes today, how do we have that joy in today's world where there's constant conflict and strife, and insufferable infighting. How do we have that joy that the prophet spoke about? How can we experience that? Look at the the uncertainty of today. Say, I want to have that joy. Well, friends, if you've already made the decision to, to follow the Lord, I've got good news for you. These words already apply for you. Do as the prophet did and, and lean into them. Trust in them. Trust in the Lord. Look to his word for examples of how he's been faithful to his people in the past. And know that he'll be faithful in the future. That's a promise that we have. In times of strife, in times of chaos, whether it be on the global scale or on the personal scale, when you don't know when the, what, what's coming, say, God, I don't know what's coming, but I'm trusting in you. I'm placing my faith in you because you've been faithful and I know you'll continue to be. But what about those who, who haven't made that decision, but who still desire to, to, have, that, to have that joy that, that the prophet refers to, to be able to look the situation in the face and say, I don't know what's coming, but Lord, I want to trust in you. How do you get that for those of you who haven't made that decision? Well, friends, I've got good news and bad news. You have to enter into a relationship with the Lord. How do you do that? Well, friends, unfortunately, we've all fallen short. We've all messed up. We've all done wrong. Nothing personal. We've all done it. Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. But the good news is, even though that we sinned, even though we messed up, even though we deserve hell and separation from the Lord for all of eternity, he still said, I love my people. I still want to be in relationship with my people. So he sent his son Jesus, his perfect sinless son, who came and lived a perfect sinless life, died on a cross and took the punishment and wrath that that we deserve. And if we simply cry out to him, if we cry out to him and ask for forgiveness and we turn from our sins, we can be forgiven. And that's how you enter into a relationship with the Lord. After that, you simply do what the first group did. You claim that promise. You lean in on those words from the Lord. So, if that's a decision you want to make today, if that's, if you even have questions, I'm about to pray and then we're going to sing. While we're singing, I'll be up here at the front. If anyone wants to to have a conversation or make a decision, come talk to me. So, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we, uh, we come to you in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus Christ, God. I pray that you move mightily in this place, God. I pray that you um, work in the lives of each and every person here, God. I, uh, I pray that you get all the honor and glory from everything that was said here today, Lord. And God, I pray that they look at me, but they see you, Lord. I pray that 
I pray that you spoke louder than I did, Lord. God, thank you for this opportunity and this, this blessing of being able to deliver your word, Lord. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.